All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so like you mentioned, um, I first talked at Hack.lu a decade ago, 2013. Then I was talking about BIOS and UEFI. That's the kind of stuff that most people were not thinking about back then. And probably a lot of you are not thinking about Bluetooth these days. So hopefully introduce something new that you haven't seen a lot about. So the about me is that what I'm talking about for Bluetooth is not actually the majority of what I do. 75% of my time is spending hundreds of hours to make 100% free as in beer, free as in freedom classes and putting them for free online at Open Security Training 2. That's a nonprofit that I started in 2021. 25% of my time is just doing research for fun and doing a little bit of consulting. And the research for fun, though, I eventually decided is a great Trojan horse to get this slide in front of you. So it's just here to tell you about open security training. And it's not just me. There's other people spending tons of their time making free classes and all sorts of cool stuff for you. So check it out. All right. So my current research thread with Bluetooth, as opposed to previous stuff, I'm still sort of in the firmware space, but now it's Bluetooth firmware instead of PC firmware. I want to know what Bluetooth chips are in any given device. So any random device, if I see it beaconing something with Bluetooth, I want to know specifically what silicon is in that device. Why do I want to know that? I want to know so I can understand, is it vulnerable to firmware level exploitation? Because it turned out, starting around 2018, people like Armis started finding vulnerabilities. You may have heard of Bleeding Bit back at the time, Blueborn before that, but Bleeding Bit was the cool one as far as I'm concerned. This was a send packets over the air, get arbitrary code execution on Bluetooth chip. That's kind of cool. The Simu Lab at TU Darmstadt, they also found this type of vulnerability in the Broadcom chips that are used by Macs and iPhones. And then in 2020, my wife, Veronica Kova, she presented at Black Hat about vulnerabilities she also found in a larger set of Texas Instruments chips and Silicon Labs chips as well. So I want to know where are her vulnerabilities applicable, but... Unfortunately, there's no good way to know that. You can ask the vendor. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to tell you every single person they ever sold a silicon to. So the first step of this is to know I know nothing. So that I was ahead of the curve on that. And then I did a whole bunch of naive Bluetooth collection. I just sniffed everywhere all the time like I'm doing right now. Um, but unfortunately, this is not that talk. Uh, that talk was not accepted. So what you get is the read the related work talk. That's what else I do to figure out how this stuff works. So there's the related work. There's the couple hundred talks that I went and read and organized and semantically tagged uh, to make it easier for other people to read the related work. And so I said in the sort of abstract that there are multiple... Oops, I gotta turn on highlighting here. There we go. There's very clearly a wave one here, right? Early days, Bluetooth Classic, it was very clear that like some people started some research, but then it kind of petered out and like nobody was doing anything with Bluetooth. And what I'm claiming is that actually this represents two independent waves, well, not entirely independent, but two different waves of research where one started petering out, but then another one took off at the same time as the other one was tailing out. And why do I know that? Because I looked at the data and it really comes down to what are the researchers doing the work? How many years are they doing the work for? And we'll see a little more detail about that in a bit. So you can find all the raw data if you go darkmentor.com, bt.html, or go to that link at the top of the site. What that's going to get you is this. This is a tiddly wiki. This is like a self-contained wiki. It's an HTML file with built-in JavaScript. So you can like take this offline and play and fiddle with it. But I just took the offline copy and stuck it on the website so you can get at it. Now, I wanted to show you like a live demo of fiddling around and searching through this, showing you the, all the greatness of semantically tagged information. Fortunately, I can't figure out how to get my travel uh, iPad to mirror its screen on these projectors. So you get a video instead. Let's see if that is actually a video. Oh, that's a screenshot. There we go. Okay, all that's going to do is scroll, and that's not super interesting. Oh, there it is. It's just not showing on mine. All right, so a bunch of... Uh, research, and then all the sort of semantic tagging at the bottom as well if you you know want to go select something specifically. But the interesting thing is just being able to search this and put in any given topic that you're interested in. If you're in, interested in Android or iOS or Windows, because everything's tagged, uh, it makes it much easier to find. So here I'm interested in this uh, Damien Coquille's research. Uh, I, if I go there and I click on some other tags, I can see all the other ones that had to do with machine in the middle attacks. I can see all the other ones that were presented first at Hack.lu. Uh, his particular one was actually presented first in just a village talk at DEF CON. Usually I only put the absolute first thing so that we don't see like repeats. Someone, someone might give the same talk like 10 times. Uh, and so we don't want to see that. 
Then, like I said, all sorts of semantic tags like attack services. I'm super interested in this. I want to know like who all is doing stuff with BE link layer traffic so I can understand like those are the type of things that are these wireless over the air exploits. So all those sort of things, which conferences, which environments, like just operating system environments usually, which organizations, protocols. There's only been two Bluetooth mesh talks ever. Uh, and then the tech that I'm interested in fuzzing, jamming, what, and test target is very literally like if someone had an individual silicon chip listed in their paper, then I try to pull that out. Okay, so wave one, like I said, very clear, and this was dominated by Trifinite Group. So back in the day, they were the ones doing all the research. A little bit of at stake, a little bit of Shmoo Group. So I'm mostly highlighting and pulling out on these graphs the people who are doing, you know, two or more talks. So there's lots and lots of one and done sort of authors, and I'm more interested in the researchers that are doing continuous work. Now, you may think that uh, Heartbleed invented the named logo trend, but actually way back in 2003, the trinite finite folks were actually, oh, I remember I'm supposed to point it that way, uh, they were doing the named logo thing back then as well. The only thing Heartbleed really innovated on is giving you a URL specifically for the vulnerability. And so all the tools, tools are important, we're going to focus on the next tools more, but tools are what obviously enable the researchers. So once you have better tools, you do better research. I believe that's called rights law by some. So wave two. All right, now we have uh, Dominic Spill and Mike Osman. So Dominic Spill did his own talk in 2007, and then Spill and Osman did joint talks in 2009, 2010, and Osman did his own talk. So I just kind of put those together so that it was more clear, like those guys were doing work in this time frame but then they were done in the Bluetooth space. Mike Ryan was doing work in this time frame, and then he was done, Damien Kakil in that. And both Mike Ryan and Kakil have a little bit more later on, but usually it's when you see the researchers doing year after year after year, that's sort of their high productivity uh, area. And so this was kind of um, the second wave, and it overlapped a little bit with the third wave, and that's why you see higher stuff here, and we'll get to that later. But you can also see that um, Bluetooth low energy research uh, started with Mike Ryan in 2012. So basically, Bluetooth low energy devices came onto the market. They were really taking off, much more so than Bluetooth Classic being used everywhere. And that meant there's a whole lot more stuff for people to try and go attack. So the tools of Wave 2 is that uh, Dominic Spill and Mike Osman, I highlighted their stuff because they gave the world Ubertooth, which was the first thing to actually give us a way to sniff Bluetooth traffic. Uh, Bluetooth, as compared to Wi-Fi, they both work in the 2.4 gigahertz range, but Bluetooth is sp spread spectrum frequency hopping. So it's like bouncing all over across 80 channels all the time. So whereas with Wi-Fi, you can just turn on a promiscuous mode sniffer and sit on one channel and sniff all the packets, Bluetooth is jumping between 80 different channels, and consequently it's much harder to sniff. Uh, the actual commercial tools use FPGAs, but they did a unique trick uh, with a radio monitor in the 2.4 gigahertz range. They used a thing that normally RF engineers try to avoid, which is signal aliasing. They intentionally caused sign signal aliasing to like overlap some of those 80 channels and be able to see the stuff. So this gave us our first ability to actually uh, sniff Bluetooth. Mike Ryan added uh, BLE support later on. Crackle from Mike Ryan in the early Bluetooth low energy when it first came out, very trivial to break because it turned out they only had support for a six-digit pin code based pairing mechanism. And so all he had to do was offline brute force of six digits, and then he could defeat the uh, pairing cryptography. That was fixed in Bluetooth spec 4.2 with elliptic curve Diffie Hellman, which we'll hear an attack for later on. The attack in 2016 gave us our first machine in the middle, and it was focused on GAT, which is a protocol where normally if you like open up a Bluetooth app on your phone and you're just like looking through what's all there, the extra metadata and information you see, that's all GAT information. And then Damien Kakil, he gave us Beetlejuice and Beetlejack. He independently created a man-in-the-middle framework at the same time as, uh, as GATAC. And then later on, he improved it with Beetlejack, giving uh, connection hijacking. So you could actually like take over the existing connections between devices. And again, tools are important because they get reused by other people for other research. <laughs> so this was like from a, a talk about hacking hotel room locks in Europe specifically. And this was their use of the BBC microbit uh, using the Beetlejack code. All right, so wave three is where we want to focus. This is, I said, you know, the last five years are what have really left Bluetooth to be. And so now if I start pulling out who are the people who are doing multiple talks, we have still some of our overlap here with uh, Ryan and Coquille, but we start having folks like uh, Simu Labs. So the, you can see they kind of dominate in the 2019, 2020, 2021 range. 
turn. Oh, use the other mic? Testing one, two, three. I don't know. It's okay for now. All right. So, uh, basically, like, uh, Jessica Clausen, she did some work. I'm, I'm pulling her out separately. She's part of Simu Lab, but, uh, she had first authorship on many different works. And so worth pulling her out independently. But yeah, basically, Simu Lab started publishing in 2017, but 2018 was really their breakthrough, uh, because they put out a tool that subsequently enabled all this other research. And then we have other folks like Ohio State University and, you know, other researchers from France and so forth. So, but what's really interesting is starting in 2018, the Bluetooth SIG, the special interest group, they had to start putting out these, oh, hey, our protocols are broken sort of advisories. So these are no longer just like implementation flaws. These are like our protocols have actual vulnerabilities that need to be fixed. And so that all started with this elliptic curve attack on in 2018. So that's kind of what's interesting about uh, Wave 3. So the tools of Wave 3, internal blue by Dennis Manns. He's a master's student at TU Darmstadt. And basically, he went and reverse engineered the Broadcom Bluetooth firmware, and he found ways to insert hooks into that. And then using those hooks, he would be able to send arbitrary packets. He'd basically just hijack the Bluetooth firmware and say, hey, I want you to send a packet that looks like this. And then now you have arbitrary uh, uh, packet sending, which is a necessary component if you're going to start doing arbitrary code execution exploits, where you need to like jam shell code or something like that into packets. And uh, yeah, it worked on the same sort of platforms as Nexmon because Simu already had ex uh, expertise in Broadcom Wi-Fi. But this was then moving on to Bluetooth. Sniffle by uh, Sultan Khan. This gave us a new and more reliable uh, Bluetooth sniffer for um, specifically new PHY encodings. So new ways that the actual physical layer uh, is encoded in the Bluetooth traffic, starting with Bluetooth spec version 5. And so this was just a, like super easy to put it on a machine and start sniffing Bluetooth. Uh, for Bluetooth Low Energy specifically. And then Sventooth and Bracktooth from 2020 and 2022 specifically. Uh, this is work out of Singapore University. And basically, they put customized firmware onto devices as a means. Again, same thing as internal blue, just different architectures, different things. You put a custom firmware on the chip, and then that thing sends custom packets for you. They then build fuzzers on top of that and use that to like fuzz all sorts of Bluetooth stuff and find all sorts of crashes and stuff. And I highly suspect a lot of their crashes probably could have been turned into arbitrary code execution bugs, but they just didn't know how to yet. So I use this right now for my like Bluetooth fingerprinting work because it lets me send arbitrary packets and I can see how things respond. All right, so going back to the actual talks from Wave 3, I said this is the last five years, lots of problems. Okay, so we have these things which are literally send a magic Bluetooth packets, get arbitrary code execution on the Bluetooth controllers. So <clears throat> no authentication, no pairing, none of that matters because... Uh, if you're familiar with like Broadpone, this was at least part of my inspiration, like Broadpone circa like 2017, I believe it was, is the same idea of like send a magic packet that is a low level Wi-Fi packet and then break into the Broadcom firmware. So there are usually like low level packets that have to occur before you do any sort of pairing authentication. All of your security that you have at the higher layers, we always have these like link layer stuff that's going to go on all pre-authentication, pre-security. And if there are parsing errors in those, then parsing errors lead to buffer overflows, buffer overflows lead to arbitrary code execution. So you can see these are the actual chips that are affected then. And so it's not just like one particular, you know, Fitbit or something like that. It's like entire chips and then every single device out there that uses those chips that's on vulnerable versions uh, is subsequently affected. So you can see all the chips there. Now, I'm claiming that these are high impact, but I'm also going to claim that we don't actually know the full impact of all these. Like, we didn't make a big hairy deal about these when my wife found it because basically we don't know where all these devices are used. And the reason for that, you need to understand a little bit about the firmware ecosystem. You've got silicon vendors like Texas Instruments, and then there are module makers like uh, LG and Partron and Panasonic Industry. These are people who basically take a Texas Instrument chip, bundle it on a nice little circuit board, put an antenna on it, and then sell that module to someone instead. So like if someone doesn't have the design capability to add like PCB antennas on their own chip, uh, on their own boards, they'll just buy a module that already has a Bluetooth antenna literally baked onto the board. So module makers and then product makers, and of course the product makers have all their products. So a Texas Instruments uh, chip could go directly to a product maker, and then that could affect certain products. But it could also go to a module maker, and the module maker then sends those to all sorts of different companies, and then that goes and affects a whole bunch of different products. 
So this is roughly analogous to uh, what we have in the PC firmware ecosystem. If you imagine silicon vendors is Intel and AMD, and for mobile phones who use UEFI, like things like Qualcomm, but let's just say Intel and AMD. Module makers, that intermediate level, that's what we call independent BIOS vendors. That's Phoenix, AMI, Inside. There's like some manufacturers in the middle. Product makers are the PC makers that you're familiar with, like Dell, HP, Lenovo, Apple, and they make all their products. Now, I, I mentioned this analogous, uh, <laughs> analogy to previous stuff just to say that if we still in the PC world are having trouble dealing with firmware ecosystem update for PCs with two vendors, Intel and AMD, it's way, way worse in the Bluetooth world because we have more than 20 silicon vendors and they've all got their own module makers who are using them. They've all got their own direct customers. And again, like there's over 3,000 product makers who are actually registered with the Bluetooth SIG. I don't think you have to be registered to like make Bluetooth devices, but those are the ones who actually bother to register. So we've got a way, way, way worse uh, supply chain issue going on here for when you start finding vulnerabilities at this level. All right. Now, a bunch of the vulnerabilities from the last five years that I'm going to talk about are things that are defeating the intrinsic uh, security of things like Bluetooth pairing. So just to recap what Bluetooth pairing is, I'm sure a lot of you have like done this at some point, but basically the idea is that you've got two devices, they want to communicate with each other, and you want to put some sort of encryption on the link between those devices so that they don't just exchange all their information in plain text. The point of pairing is to provide encryption and or authentication between those two devices. So fundamentally, a device maker could choose like, hey, I don't care about any of that. You know, Fitbit can say, you know what, you can just connect to my device, no authentication, I don't care, it's all good. And lots of vendors, unfortunately, do just completely ignore security. Now, some of them still put like application layer encryption, but a lot of them don't. So they can either put the Bluetooth built-in link layer encryption, or they can put the application layer if they'd like. But the absence of pairing means that you will either A, have an ability for an attacker to sniff the traffic, like see the actual plain text going between devices, or they have the capability to do a machine in the middle attack between them. Uh, and also some of the pairing methods just straight up are intrinsically known by design to not try to prevent machine in the middle attacks. So uh, basically just works is like instead of exchanging a pin code, you just say the default pin code is six zeros and that's it. They'll just automatically work and it's nice for convenience and it's bad for security, of course. Now, there are attack surfaces that I care about from like an arbitrary code execution perspective that I can't necessarily always get access to unless I have the capability to communicate with the device. And sometimes the device will say, no, you can't talk to me unless you've turned on encryption. You can't talk to me unless you've turned on authentication. So just to get access to some of those attack surfaces, like in the GAT protocol, I need to have encryption or authentication. So now with that said, I'm going to talk about all sorts of issues of pairing over the last five years where they've beaten that uh, pairing. So first one, 2018, kicking off all these protocol bugs. Basically, there was a core vulnerability in the way that they implemented elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman in the Bluetooth spec. So if you're doing everything right according to the spec, you're doing things wrong. So basically, elliptic curve, you've got a curve and there's a point on that curve. It's an XY coordinate. Well, it turned out Bluetooth spec said you only need to verify the X coordinate. You don't need to verify the Y coordinate. And so then the attacker who is in the machine in the middle capability could like choose the infinite point for the Y coordinate. And then with 25% probability, uh, they'd be able to successfully decrypt it. And there was other games they could play that would increase their probability to 50%. Uh, Knob was the kind of thing where when you see this, you just say, like, what were they thinking? Like, how could this kind of vulnerability be in the spec? This was a vulnerability where there is an agreement between the parties doing pairing where they say, hey, I would like this level of security strength. But it turned out that the spec allowed for specifying a key entropy level. You could say it's going to be a 16-byte, 128-bit key. Or you could say, I actually want a 1-byte, 8-bit key. And if you're going with an 8-bit key, that's going to be trivially brute forceable. And so ultimately, the, the spec fix for that was to say, you know what? Don't accept anything less than 7 bytes, 56-bit key. But we know from decades ago that 56-bit keys in the context of DES and stuff like that were crackable. So they're really setting the higher bar very much lower than you would want to see for decent security. So this is just the actual key exchange. If there's a machine in the middle, they can overlay. Instead of asking for 16-byte, they ask for 1-byte. <clears throat> 
Uh, subsequently, they found the exact same sort of attack on Bluetooth Low Energy, but it, that one at least didn't let you go all the way down to one byte to start with. It only went down to seven bytes. Now, those sort of attacks required a machine in the middle in order to pull it off, in order to lie on behalf of the other side and say, hey, I actually want one byte key. Uh, and so then, subsequently, the researchers found uh, specifically a way to get that machine in the middle position. So they had a separate talk called BIAS. And in this, uh, Bluetooth had the concept of master-slave. And so the slave had to authenticate itself to the master, but the master didn't have to authenticate itself to the slave. But there's also a capability for what's called role switch, where the master can say, actually, I want to be the slave. And the slave can say, actually, I want to be the master. And that's used for things like Bluetooth keyboards, for instance. Your desktop PC may connect to the keyboard, and so the PC is the master, the keyboard's the slave. But then they want to switch roles and say, actually, the keyboard's going to be the master, and it'll let you know when there's any Bluetooth keys coming so that you don't have to you know, pull it or anything like that. So it turned out, basically, because of the fact that it's only unidirectional authentication, it's not mutual authentication, uh, Bob, uh, uh, Charlie, acting, so the attacker acting as Bob, could say, hey, I want to do this LE secure connection. I'm Bob, by the way. Alice says, okay, cool, let's do that. Bob says, here's your challenge. Alice says, here's my authentication, proving that I know the long-term key. And then Charlie just says, okay, yeah, cool, whatever. I don't care about that. Now... Uh, Charlie can do the same thing. He can do the same thing with a role switch so that when he's talking to the master, uh, he can he can switch it around and become the master. And then uh, Bob will say, okay, here's my authentication challenge. And then Charlie can say, I don't care. Now, the key thing here is the attacker is not actually gaining the access to the key. They're just manipulating the communication in a way that both sides think that they've got an authenticated channel. And so then some of those attack services that I was talking about before, like GAT, now the internal logic of the chip is going to say, okay, well, I know that I've got, you know, Alice talks to Bob, Bob talks to Alice, there's Charlie in the middle, and they think that they've got authenticated, and so now Charlie can start hitting those attack surfaces as if he was authenticated, even though he doesn't you know, actually have the long-term key. Um, and this talk right here, I'm calling this an important talk, not a high-impact talk. The high-impact talks are the things that like affect downstream and many devices. This talk is important for my talk today because it proves my point my point of this talk is that there's been a whole bunch of protocol bugs and getting them fixed in the wild is going to be nigh impossible and therefore all sorts of devices in the wild are all going to be architecturally vulnerable for a long time. This talk by the BIOS and NOB researchers in 2022, they said, hey, it's 2022, we disclosed BIOS in 2018 or maybe it's 2019, sorry, NOB in 2019, BIOS in 2020. They said, theoretically, everything's patched now, right? Like the SIG put out their patch alerts. Everyone supposedly, you know, the, the silicon vendors did their patches and the module makers did their patches and the device vendors did their patches, right? No, like cars were still rolling off the line with, with both the BIOS and knob vulnerability. So they just showed like, we can just take our stuff. It's old, it's patched, it's end day. But guess what? It's still affecting all these cars that they were grabbing head units off of eBay or they tested on their own personal cars and showed that they're still vulnerable. All right. There's a blue mirror, which was um, by the, the French security service. And they showed that there are a type of attack called reflection attacks, where when you have authentication protocols, uh, you like someone sends you a challenge, but then you just turn around and you send that back to them and you say, yeah, that's my challenge. And because of that, you lead to cryptographic situations in which sometimes the attacker can actually extract the key and other times they're just successfully uh, achieving the authentication as far as the other side is concerned. So this one got a whole bunch of Bluetooth SIG um, in instances, uh, notices. I like this one particularly because it's saying literally every version of the Bluetooth spec ever is vulnerable to this particular impersonation attack. And they looked at the related work, so there had been all these other papers that had looked at ways to defeat uh, Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy. And they said, okay, well, according to the spec, the stuff in blue is the authenticated key agreements. Uh, the stuff in black is the secure authenticated key agreements because there are things that they consider insecure because just architecturally they allow for machine-in-the-middle attacks. And the thing circled in red is the stuff that they defeated. So basically, they defeated all the secure stuff except these numeric comparison things. And again, you know, theoretically, they're patched, but practically speaking, no, everything's going to be vulnerable to those kind of things. Injectable was interesting because they found that they can utilize timing variants between packet sending to inject new packets into connections that they have no crypto key for and which they're not involved in at all. 
And what this fundamentally comes down to is I said that Bluetooth is spread spectrum frequency hopping. And so sometimes Bluetooth devices are going to say, hey, you know what? It's time instant right now. Let's talk again at time instant plus D offset. Let's talk later on. Let's maybe, you know, change channels, something like that. And so the listener, the slave listens, the master talks first, and the listener has to like listen a little bit on either side of that because there's like clock skew between devices. They don't know exactly when the other is going to talk. And so an attacker can just jam in a packet in that little window, and if they get in there early enough while the listener is listening and before the legitimate master speaks, then their packet will be interpreted with you know no need for fi fixing the authentication or encryption or anything like that. It'll just be parsed and processed by the victim slave device. Again, I care about the arbitrary code execution type things. So if now all of a sudden I can like jam in these link layer packets that don't require encryption in the first place, if there's bugs in those sort of processing as there have been in the past, then I get an exploit for free. All right, final thing to talk about is this is an attack on proximity-based authentication. So if you have a Tesla, then you know that your phone acts as your key. And when you walk up to your Tesla, then the, the, the Tesla detects, okay, they're close to me and they can do the cryptographic challenge between the phone and the car. That's a combination of both the crypto, but it's also RSSI based. So it receives signal strength indicator and saying the Tesla trusts that the, you know, it's not someone like far away. They have to be close. They have to have the right crypto key. So uh, what uh, what Sultan Khan showed and what they didn't release because Tesla chose not to fix this is that you can basically install sort of, you know, you can have two proxying devices. And so if the legitimate master is your phone, for instance, and you're off at a conference, and if the legitimate slave is your car and your car is parked out in the parking lot, then someone walks up to you inside the conference and they've got a little Raspberry Pi and it's talking to your phone and the other Raspberry Pi is communicating over the cellular network and it's talking to your Tesla. The Raspberry Pi next to the Tesla has high signal strength, so the Tesla trusts that bit, and then it proxies through this link layer traffic and it can actually do the communication fast enough that, you know, there's the Tesla isn't going to get suspicious that like, oh, it was like took them too long. They must be proxying. So they didn't release this because Tesla didn't fix it because this is just in Tesla's threat model. And it's in a lot of vendors threat model that like just, OK, well, I don't want to say it's explicitly in a lot of vendors threat models. A lot of vendors accept this vulnerability whether you know whether they fully understand the implications or not tesla i think does understand the implications because tesla has mitigations in the form of we have a cellular link to your car and we can track your car you know all the time anywhere so there's anti-theft mitigations from that perspective but uh, there's all sorts of other devices that rely on this all right cool i'm almost on time so that was uh, just a quick smattering of stuff from the last five years, a whole bunch of protocol vulnerabilities that I'm claiming are not actually going to be patched in the wild in practice. Um, so basically, we've got a pico net of things, patch management conundrum. So I want to claim that Bluetooth is actually worse than even just Internet of Things. Because Internet of Things, if your fridge is on the Internet, your fridge can get updates from the Internet. But most of the Bluetooth devices are never on the Internet themselves, right? Bluetooth is not an IP network. Bluetooth does not get on the Internet. New stuff like Matter, that used to be called Connected Home over IP, those are literally new protocols where they're trying to get IP so that things like Bluetooth can speak IP, but it doesn't today. So Bluetooth devices are generally going to rely on phones or computers or some other proxy to give them firmware updates. So first of all, when these sort of uh, spec level vulnerabilities come out, you got to go through the disclosure, then you got to get all the silicon vendors to update, then you got to get all the module makers to update, then you got to get all the operating system and real time operating system. So it's not just the Microsoft, Apple, Linux, it's also all the Zephyr Minute and ThreadX and embedded operating systems that exist in these sort of embedded devices. They got to all do firmware updates, and then you got to deploy those, and then the device makers have to pick up silicon vendor, module maker, or RTOS updates, and then they have to update their devices, right? And how do they update the devices? Like I said, best case, phone. Uh, worst case, something like you have to plug in a USB stick or something like that. But uh, a lot of things, if you have the out-of-date phone application, like if you don't have auto phone app updates, you're not going to get the updated firmware for your associated Bluetooth device. Many devices don't even need a Bluetooth connection to work properly. Like just quick survey of my house, I have a gaming controller that's Bluetooth, a bathroom scale, a blood pressure monitor, and my bed does Bluetooth, but they don't need the phone connection. The phone connection is a nice to have, 
but they don't need it, and therefore I don't usually have my phone connected to them, and therefore I guess I'm not updating my firmware on all those things. Uh, and yeah, some things have been shown to also, like just in general, this is an embedded security problem, frequently have uh, insecure firmware update channels. So, and let's not even talk about all the end-of-life devices that are never ever going to get a patch because their end-of-life or the company went out of date. So, my call to action, here's where I shout, turn on the volume, join me, and together we will rule the Bluetooth galaxy. All right, so I need more Bluetooth researchers, you know, we need to keep, keep the wave growing. So, the conclusion is, Bluetooth vulnerability assessment is not even a thing that, you know, for all of those of you who work enterprise security, I'm happy to tell you, don't worry, there's nothing you have to do because there's nothing you could do even if you wanted to. I hope that makes you feel better. Um, but yeah, like it needs more research. I organized this information, put it into the timeline specifically because that helps me be able to cross-reference like, oh, what's doing this kind of attack and that kind of thing. So uh, more research is needed. All right, as I said, that's it. This is not what I do. Bluetooth is not what I do is my main thing. That's my 25% of my thing. Open security training, doing hundreds of hours to make free classes for you. That's my main thing. We will have Bluetooth classes that will help us build more Bluetooth security researchers, but we need to wait for my wife to get done with her current research, and we need to wait for me to finish my next, next RISC-V assembly class. So with that, I'm out of time. Thank you. And I'll probably take questions off to the side. Thank you.